Thank you so much, Karen, for being here for our fourth episode of Trace Talks. It's a pleasure to have you, and I'm so excited to just dive right in. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. Absolutely. So let's start with your journey first. Tell us about how, how your journey has unfolded and give us all the trials and tribulations you know, over your career. Yeah, sure. So, um, so obviously now the the end point is that electromagnetic compatibility is sort of my uh, my go-to area and the the part that I'm really have become passionate about. But at the beginning, that would not have been anywhere that was not on my radar. Okay. Um, so I had my bachelor's degree in physics and uh, came out from from that uh, went into the aerospace industry. But I worked in radar signal processing. So we were writing algorithms for um, uh, basically, yeah, radar tracking and tracking of, uh, you know, ballistic targets. Um, and that, that job was fine, um, but it was pretty boring. <laughs> but I thought that that's what uh, having an aerospace career was, right? Like, you go into an aerospace company, and you have a nice, steady, boring career for the next 35 years, and then you retire. Um but it got boring enough <laughs> that when I had a chance to go back to grad school, uh, I actually moved with family to uh, uh, Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. started a master's degree in electrical engineering, okay. and in that process got recruited as a uh, contractor at Johnson Space Center. Oh, okay. So, I mean, that was basically luck. <laughs> but at Johnson, when I was introduced to some folks, and they're like, oh, Karen's got physics and electrical engineering, and a couple people who were already EMC experts there were like, "Oh, really? <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna grab you for for why don't you come over here? Um, right, right. We we might have a home for you." And it turned out that was my thing. Um, That's great. Once I started to get into the technical side of it and um, you know, meet the people, the the EMC community is surprisingly collaborative and full of just like really interesting people. That's great. Um, so yeah, that's been my home community ever since. And so I've been really lucky. So I started at NASA, but I, I started sort of as the shuttle program was ending. And so being a NASA contractor at that point was, you know, a little, um, little hairy, a little dicey. Um, so as, you know, uh, having to move around, I wound up at, um, I was the lead EMC engineer on the Dream Chaser spacecraft. Um, oh, wow when that was going to be a crew vehicle. Uh, but then they lost that competition to Boeing and SpaceX, and we, we all know how that turned out. Um, but unfortunately, a bunch of us got laid off. So then I was in Maryland. I was a test director for a while at Northrop Grumman, uh, working on some modules that went on F-35. Um, and again, Maryland wasn't quite the right fit. So I wound up in Michigan at Ford Motor Company. And honestly, I'd say that in a lot of ways, that's where I went from just being an EMC engineer to really like an, a good EMC engineer. Uh, because in the automotive industry, you get just a lot more hands-on troubleshooting. Um, especially at NASA, you know, if things go wrong, there's mountains of paperwork and you pretty much don't, aren't allowed to touch hardware. <laughs> if you're an actual engineer, like that's what technicians do, you don't touch hardware. Um, but in the automotive industry, it's like you get in there and you fix it, whatever it takes. And um, so I got to, to dive into a lot of different aspects of EMC there. It's a lot of things to interact and a lot of things to get weird. Uh, and then they were going, uh, they were moving back towards hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, so I got to to really dig into the electric vehicle side of things. And there's even more that can go wrong <laughs> <laughs> with electric vehicles. Um, and then for mostly for family reasons, I wanted to get back to uh, to Colorado and to the Denver area. Um, so I took a job with EMC, sorry, EMA, electromagnetic applications out there. They do a lot of computational electromagnetics. I was there mostly as a program manager and as a consultant, really focusing on the EMC side, uh, guiding a lot of the younger uh, simulation engineers of like what's important and what's not and, you know, uh, how to tell when results make sense. Um, and then most recently, I was able to um, go out on my own, and I've started my own consulting company called EMC United. Uh, we've got a little bit of lab capability, and, and um, you know, we do training, and we do consulting, we do troubleshooting, and uh, it has been really fun so far. That's fantastic. Uh, tell us more about that. When did you start your own 
consulting firm? <laughs> in officially in July of 2024. <laughs> so you can see how how uh, ancient my company is. <laughs> um, but it's. Um, Again, it's sort of moving to back to my core strengths, right? Because sure. when people contact EMA, mm -hmm. they're really looking for that simulation uh, design advice. Um, right. You know, they're not going to call up EMA to do troubleshooting. Right, right. That's that because that's not what EMA ha has historically done. Right. Uh, and I really missed that part. I missed right. the hands-on aspect. You know, the right. uh, the more problem-solving aspect of it. Um, now, obviously, my goal with the training and the education and doing talks for, for you guys and for the IEEE and, and uh, whoever will have me is so that engineers who've never heard of EMC, they, because it doesn't get taught in colleges, right. um, my goal is to try and give them the fundamentals that they need so that they don't have to have troubleshooting later, right? right like, right. do it right the first time. It's cheaper and faster for everybody uh, and way less headaches. But until that message gets out to everybody, um, you know, there's still going to be troubleshooting to do, and, <laughs> and I enjoy doing it. <laughs> no, that's a that's actually a great segue um, to, you know, as an engineer, you know, what are the things I should be looking for um, early on, uh, and and yeah, just dive right into something, you know, like what what advice do you have for our listeners around that? Yeah, absolutely. So. All the EMC problems really start at the PCB level, okay. and then they can manifest at every level above that. Um, sometimes on the board, sometimes not until you're looking at an entirely fully assembled electric vehicle city bus, <laughs> which oh, is one of the things I got to troubleshoot. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, but fundamentally, it's there are certain things that are going to generate electromagnetic noise, and uh, I think the th everyone's kind of aware that motors are going to generate noise. Um, things that have sparks, like it used to be one of the only things you worried about on a car was the spark igniters, right, from the fuel injection right. system interfering with the AM radio. That was like it. <laughs> Cars have gotten a lot more complicated since then. A lot more sophisticated. Uh, there's, there's a lot more stuff to go wrong. Um, but one of the things that I think is uh, less obvious to people mm -hmm. is that any switching operation generates electromagnetic noise. Right. Um, and that's not, oh, sometimes it does that. That's what happens when you have switching operations. Now, that means DC to DC converters. So just because you have you know, DC on one side and DC on the other, all the switching that happens to go from like, you know, wall power to 12 volts or wall power to 5 volts or 5 volts to 3.3, that's all generating electromagnetic noise at higher and higher frequencies. Um, now that noise can be more severe, it can be less severe, but it's always there. The other thing is um, every single digital electronic system fundamentally is switching voltages. Right. That's how we do, you know, all those billions of transistors that we've got on the chips, switching, 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 right? That's, that's what they spend their entire lives doing. All those switching operations generate electromagnetic noise. Now, again, mostly at the chip level, the current involved is so tiny that, right. you know, yes, it's generating electromagnetic noise, but it's nanoamps pico amps. It's not something every, you know, that's going to really cause a problem unless you get really unlucky, which does sometimes happen. Um, but the fundamental clock frequencies, a lot of times you'll see noise at, at those frequencies or at their harmonics. Power supply switching, really, really common. And then the more power you're dealing with, the worse the noise problems get. So that's where electric vehicles, where you're switching, you know, just huge amounts of power from the DC battery to the AC motor. Who oh, that gets that gets really extreme. So what would you recommend as a solution for in those in that type of a scenario? So the main thing in my mind is to um, be aware of those noise sources and then think about think about controlling that noise. Um, and it's, it's a little weird to say, but uh, it's almost like we all need to be RF engineers now. Um, which, you know, RF engineering, it's so precise, right? 
obviously we're not saying that everybody has to run, you know, a trace with two guard traces on every board. That would be insane. Um, but just think about uh, the fact that there is high frequency content on these traces, where are the fields associated with that likely to go, where the return current's going. And I think, you know, there are a lot of, uh, well, <laughs> a lot of it. It's a pretty small world. There's a handful of EMC consultants out there who, uh, like myself, do a lot of different, you know, training and, and teaching efforts. And I think almost all of us are like, remember that they're return currents and you need to understand where they go. Because uh, on the schematics, you know, there'll be, you know, there's the chip and then there's pins coming off the chip. And then there's like one or two that just say ground. And it goes to a ground symbol. And it's easy to forget that there's a physical reality behind that just eek, ground symbol. Um, you know, it, that means that it's probably going to a ground plane. What does that plane look like? If it's got tons of islands and slots, that's going to make the return path for the current very uh, difficult. And that is going to lead to more likely uh, having um, potential radiator conducted emissions problems. That's the kind of thing that we um, that we run into kind of over and over and over again. Um, so just thinking about where the return current's going and how can you make that path as easy as possible, especially for those traces that are going to be carrying a little more current uh, and that have those switch, you know, are, are associated with those switching operations. That's one of the reasons why power supplies, you know, are so often a, a, a main focus for for EMC engineering. No, oh, that makes sense and. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The podcast is for you electrical engineers and PCB designers out there to learn from. And we also have an amazing discussion forum that we recently launched called Sierra Connect. So go there right now, post your questions, and industry experts will respond to your questions. It's an amazing resource that you should take advantage of. What if you have mechanical constraints, though? What if the board has to have like this odd shape and cutouts and... You know, and then, of course, your ground's going to follow that a little bit. What What do you do when you're kind of, you're, you're backed into a corner? Like, how would you oh, yeah. handle and that? Th that? That's one of the things is that we know that, you know, PCB designers are facing so many constraints when they're exactly. designing, right? You're trying to minimize your layer count. You're trying to minimize your bomb count. Uh, you have to fit whatever the form factor is. Um, you know, in aerospace, you've got to add all this stuff for like radiation hardening and in automotive, of course, you're trying to, um, you usually don't have, um, you've got plastic housing, <laughs> which can, you know, be its own challenge. Um, again, if you, if you're thinking about, um, if you're aware of the noise sources, you can kind of focus on those. And even if you do have to have lots of splits in your ground plane, uh, you can, uh, be uh, smart about your layout so that the things that need segregated grounds mm -hmm. um, are grouped together. So basically, um, you know, your sort of noisy power stuff, your low, very low frequency stuff will kind of all be over here. And then the stuff that maybe needs more protection can be a little bit more over here. And the thing that you really want to avoid is routing traces over splits. And there's right. all kinds of reasons for that. Of um, course, but yeah. again, every EMC engineer is going to tell you the same thing. It's like, don't route traces over splits. <laughs> um, so if instead of completely islanding an area, um, you know, you sort of leave a bridge and then let the traces go over that bridge, just a, a you know, a simple thing like that can make a huge difference. Sure. Have you, uh, can you uh, come up with an example where you faced a challenge, you know, in either the aerospace or automotive industry and just kind of dive into that, like how you, you know, peel the onion back and how you uncovered it and how you solve for something? I do sometimes, uh, especially after some of the troubleshooting I did in the automotive industry, I do tend to refer to it as the EMC onion because there are lots of layers oh, yeah? and okay. they, they all make you cry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was one vehicle that um, it was a luxury SUV hybrid plug-in electric vehicle. Okay. So it had all the fancy electronics modules. It had something like 60 uh, modules reporting on the low voltage uh, oh. CAN bus. Uh, then it had 
an, an internal combustion engine, right, because it's hybrid, but it was also a plug-in, so it had the plug charge port, and it had um, the electric vehicle, you know, so the battery pack and the inverter and, and all of that. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's a lot of stuff to go wrong. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that we found is that, um, you know, we would track one problem down and run it all the way down and find a fix for it and then put it back in the chamber and test it again, and it would... And then it would turn out that problem was just masking another problem. <laughs> oh, geez. So let's see. Some of the things that we did there, one of the things that, um, this is true kind of everywhere, but in automotive, it was, that's where it um, always hit, hit me the hardest, was that chamber time is very limited. You know, there's only like a couple big EMC chambers where you can get a full vehicle in. And there are a lot of vehicles that need to get through right. all their testing. So we'd find a problem, and then we'd have to get out of there. Right to troubleshoot it. And that, you know, um, when you, there's no point in setting up like big antennas in a garage. You're just gonna pick up, you know, if, all the noise from everything. I mean, the lights uh, give you insane amounts of noise. So um, focusing in on uh, the kind of troubleshooting equipment that you can use when you're not in a controlled environment. So current probes are like my go-to, um, especially for something big like a car where you know there are cables that you can clamp a current probe around and you can just kind of um, walk through the different uh, the different cable harnesses and see which ones seem to be you know showing a noise in the same frequency range that your radiated test did. Um, another good one didn't use this as much in the automotive industry but at the PCB level near field probes so they're they're very small um, but they reject the noise in kind of the big ambient environment and only react to things that they're very, very close to. Hmm. So again, it lets you do troubleshooting in a, in a noisier environment. Um, let's see. So yeah, so a lot of time we were spent uh, uh, with current probes going around finding out where problems were. Um, but one of the weirdest that I found was um, there was a company who was uh, taking big utility trucks and turning them into electric vehicles, which is awesome. Like, that is a good thing to be doing. Uh, but they, every one was hand-built. Oh, geez. So every one had, like, a little bit different cable routing and a little bit different this and a little bit different that, different configurations. Um, so, like, over the course of a year, they'd been, like, chasing gremlins. And it wasn't until a new guy came in who had worked with me before who was like, oh, this isn't 20 different problems. You've got an EMC problem. It's just manifesting differently on all these different wow. vehicles. Um, but they had a couple, and when they, they called me in, um, we were able to, no, the thing is, so they'd spent a year chasing gremlins. They'd spent about six weeks going, okay, and we know we have an EMC problem, and like kind of messing with things. I had two days. <laughs> like, okay, well, let's, uh, let's, Let's, Let's roll up right, our sleeves. <laughs> Let's get right to it. Um, and this was in an unair un conditioned garage in the Midwest in the summer. Whew, that was, we were really building character. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so we were going through the current probes, um, but we were also dealing with challenges that they had bought all these components from a supplier and didn't necessarily understand the EV system. They were, you know, buying off-the-shelf parts, putting it in their vehicles. Oh, geez. And um, so it, you know, they weren't necessarily getting the all the information they needed from the supplier. So that was one challenging thing. Yeah, the, there was just noise everywhere. <laughs> so figuring out where the problem was. Finally, one of us was under a vehicle, under the vehicle, and we were just going. Uh, step by step, every single box that was hanging off the high voltage system. Okay, you know, and one of them's like, oh yeah, and there's also this water heater. So a lot of people don't realize that um, in EVs, a lot of times they will use the high voltage system to drive some of the environmental controls because it needs so much more cooling power. And so he's like, oh yeah, I think I see the water heater. And somebody actually asked, well, that's metal, right? And then they knocked and it was plastic. <laughs> We we're like, no, <laughs> like this can't, because a high voltage system, everything's housed in metal and you've got point to point shielding, like a continuous shield until you hit this plastic box. 
<laughs> and th- it was painted black. So like everyone just assumed it was metal until somebody knocked on it and just had that hollow plastic sound. Right, and we right. were like, our hearts just like sank. And we were like, no. And it even looked like it had a ground point on it. Oh, wow. That wasn't actually connected to anything. <laughs> So we found the problem. Yeah, you found the problem. <laughs> um, and I, I, I will say that once we finally pinned down that, yes, that was the problem, and basically uh, because you had this long, unterminated cable shield, so the cable shield had picked up noise from the converters, the big high-voltage converters, and that's very, very common. It's really hard to completely avoid having that noise on your shields. But the main way you control that is by having shields that are very well terminated, Um, So you've got what is the closest you can get to to a complete Faraday cage around your high voltage system. Uh, But when one end of that Faraday cage is just wide open, (laughs) connected to absolutely nothing conductive, uh, yeah, that's that's not going to work quite so well. (laughs) The terrifying thing about Mm. that particular case was that if you turned on the water heater, Mm -hmm. the problem went away. Oh, geez. Which means that somehow the noise that was on that cable, when the water heater circuitry was activated, still found a path back to chassis ground. Wow. And we're like, (laughs) we're just going to give it an actual ground and pretend that we never saw that. (laughs) Because that was so, again, we're like... That's bizarre, yeah. and again, EMC, it, I think that's one of the reasons why EMC gets this reputation for black magic. Because if you're thinking to yourself, I turn the water heater on and the problem goes away, <laughs> that feels just like, you know, yes. woo woo, absolutely bizarre nonsense. Um, but there is always an actual reason for why these things are doing what they're doing. Sierra Circuits has been working very hard for electrical engineers and PCB designers like yourself on our engineering tools. These are engineering tools to help you design faster. We want to reduce your design time and get the design right the first time. So our top tools on our website, number one is the PCB Stackup Planner. Uh, Knowing that you have a good stackup right away uh, for your design. Number two is the Bomb Checker. It will do basic scrubbing, make sure your ref deses are good, your MPNs are good, the MPN matches the description. You know, all these are amazing features of the bomb checker. Uh, We also have an impedance tool, uh, which is based on Maxwell's equations. uh, And these are all for free for the PCB designer and electrical engineer. You know, please go check them out. It's all for you. You really broke that down well. Um, Does that play into what you call the EMC fire triangle at all? Do you want to to talk about that a little bit and, and just... How basically give techniques for people, you know, to who are facing these types of issues. Yeah, absolutely. So w- there's a thing I call the EMC fire triangle, and that is um, the idea that a lot of us learned as kids that to have a fire you need three things: uh, you need fuel, and you need oxygen, and you need a heat source. And if you can take away one of those things, you've put out the fire. So you can like smother it with a blanket, and that takes away the oxygen, or you can you know, pour water on it, that essentially takes away the heat. To have an EMC problem, you need three things. Uh, You need a noisy source, a sensitive victim, and a coupling path between them. And that coupling path can either be radiated or it can be, um, you know, conducted when you've got a lot of stuff hanging off the same power bus. Um, To me, the really helpful thing about thinking about it that way is it always gives you multiple avenues to attack a problem. And that's especially valuable when um, you're in a situation, again, you know, like a vehicle prototype already exists, right? They're testing it. They're they're getting ready to launch. And so you're like, okay, there's an EMC problem. I've identified the source. Can I add filtering to just make the source quieter? No, oh, my God, that would require a respin, and it'll cost a billion dollars, and it'll take two years, and, and find another way to fix it, Right. Okay, well, I know what the victim is. Can I, like, throw some ferrites on it? Can I put some shielding around the, the, the victim? Oh, my God, that would add $20 per car. You know, the whole company will go out of business. Find another way to fix it. Uh, so then you can, try, like, maybe try and attack the, the coupling path or, or what have you. you. It gives you lots of avenues um, into a problem. Right. Once you've identified those three elements, 
Um, which again is, is really good because pretty much every time I was uh, troubleshooting in the automotive industry, it usually took about five tries before I could find a solution that fixed the problem and was acceptable to the program. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, that makes a lot of sense. I really like how you broke that down and the thought process behind it. And I can see how this could be very fun to like find, find solutions to these problems. It, it really is. I yeah. mean, again, I hope to live in a world someday where no one needs EMC troubleshooting. I want to educate them into how to keep the problems from happening. But I won't lie, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's so satisfying when you finally, you know, find that solution that, that works and everyone can move with. Absolutely, absolutely. So what do you think are like the challenges that are, you know, the new challenges that people will be facing in, you know, in, in regards to EMC with all the new electronics and, you know, even the aerospace, we didn't really talk about aerospace very much, but you know, we can you know, dive into that a little bit. But what do you see as kind of the new challenges that will be coming up? Man, faster and faster. Everything's getting faster and faster, which is awesome, right? Like I, I love all the new bells and whistles and gadgets, and and you know I'm as excited about you know stuff coming out of of um, you know right here Silicon Valley as as anybody, um, and what people are doing in aerospace now. It, I mean, it's fantastic. Um, but again, uh, when you've got faster switching speeds, faster clock speeds, faster communication links, all of that means that your um, Electromagnetic noise frequencies that are associated with all those options are just going, getting pushed higher and higher and higher. And the really tricky thing there is that the higher frequency noise you're doing with, the smaller the thing that can start radiating that you didn't realize. So on, you know, the, like I say, the cars that I used to work on, you've got, you know, um, cable bundles that are running a couple meters. And, you know, so a lot of the noise there is going to be eh, between like 500 kilohertz and 100 megahertz. That's where most of that noise happens. And that's, it's not that hard to, to kind of pin down and deal with. Um, but when you have clocks in the gigahertz, now something that's only a centimeter can be an effective radiator and start like busting your FCC limits or causing signal integrity problems. Um, and then when you start getting even higher than that, like some of the uh, KA band satellite links, so that's up in the 20 gigahertz, you know, it only takes millimeters of stuff before you can uh, end up with radiating, radiating elements that you did not expect. Um, so that's, that's really fundamentally, um, there's other, one other thing that, um, I've got a whole talk that, that dives into some of the details, but the electromagnetic field strength that can, um, result from some of these issues, one radiating mechanism, the field strength goes up with the square of frequency <laughs> instead of linearly with frequency. So when you move from megahertz to gigahertz, you're not just going like a thousand times, you're going like, what, a million times worse, wow. potentially worse. Wow. Um, so again, every time you're getting faster, um, you know, the, the obvious benefits for the functionality are huge, but it means that you have to pay much more attention to the EMC uh, potential issues. How should, you know, design engineers change their methodology in, you know, in their process to, to deal with these early on? Like, do you think simulation has a role to play? Um, you know, what what advice do you have? Yeah, it's a it's kind of a an all and answer. I think, um, and you guys run into this as well from the manufacturing side that there's a lot of stuff that we don't get taught in college um, as electrical engineers, as manufacturing engineers, or you know, embedded software engineers. Um, there's sort of that. There's the idea, the conceptual idea of what you want hardware to do and the software that needs to run it. And then there's that like, okay, now we're talking about user experience and form factor and all these other wonderful things, but how you get from point A to point B, it's a lot of detail right. in there that we need to fill out uh, that you know, a lot of PCB layout is not taught in colleges. EMC maybe comes up once, <laughs> if you're lucky. There's you know, only a handful of professors in the States who actually will teach a course on EMC for either undergraduates or graduates. Um, so getting some of that education, so you can spot the red flags. You know, again, don't don't route traces over ground splits. If you see a trace routed over a ground split, that should you know, ah. Um, there have existed for a long time rule checkers 
which will look for exactly those kind of things. Or trace is routed too close to the edge of a board or, you know, um, unbalanced lines and things like that. I know that those can be frustrating to work with. Uh, a lot of people that I've talked to say they just throw up too many false positives. They, the, the list right. is too long to work through. True. Um, and again, that's where having, um, I think, just some fairly foundational education of how EMC problems actually happen can um, it give you a faster way to get through that list and, and kind of use your own judgment of what really matters and what you probably don't have to worry about. Um, simulation tools are getting better and better. Uh, they're, not, they're not quite at the point where you can just take an Altium design file, feed it into a simulation program, and say, hey, will I pass FCC testing? <laughs> you know, push a button and get a yes or no answer. Not quite there yet. Um, but they are getting more and more sophisticated. So if you, you know, if you sort of know the right questions to ask and know the right systems to focus on, so especially like power supplies, right? If you've got, um, one of the things that, that I've worked on is uh, like um, an integrated medical device. So it's got, you know, video displays, it'll display things to the doctors, and then it's got sensors that are, you know, reading things about the patients and it's integrating all that. But, you know, uh, as part of that whole stand-up unit that's going to get wheeled around an operating room, it's got power supplies. Um, thinking to yourself, ah, those power supplies have the potential, you know, to be an issue. Maybe we can do some simulations, uh, you know, knowing whatever we know about the power supplies, what frequencies, you know, switching frequency and how much current it draws and stuff like that. Do we see a risk to, for instance, any of our sensing equipment? Like... I think, again, having that kind of fundamental um, understanding where the risk factors are lets you zero in and use simulation more effectively or more efficiently. You know, I think what everybody wants, it's that same thing with the simulation, right? right. What we want is to be able to feed in your design file and hit a button, will I pass FCC or not? Right. Um, and it's kind of the same thing. Everybody would love to have an AI that will be like, hey, I've got this schematic lay out my PCB for me in a way that will comply with every single, you know, uh, regulation and standard that I need this to comply to. Right. Um, we're <laughs> just not there yet. Not at all. Um, <laughs> we still need people. <laughs> well, and, and the thing is, you know, the, the big breakthroughs that have, that have um, been happening and that have gotten all the media attention are all based on language processing. Right. That doesn't help you with PCB design. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a completely different knowledge sphere right. that we need um, to get the AIs trained up in. And I personally don't see a comparable data set. Like, you know, because the LLMs, right. they trolled the entire Internet. Right. Like, however many trillions of published words right. were involved to make those models. I mean... There probably aren't trillions of PCB designs in the world yet. Um, and then most of the ones that do exist are inside somebody's firewall, right? They're proprietary to of certain companies. Um, I know people are working on training AI and ML with simulations. Um, but then we kind of run back into the concern where sometimes, especially for EMC, and I'm sure there are other disciplines that are in the same boat. Uh, it's just the one I know the best. Um, simulations don't always capture everything. So, uh, like I say, man, I, I know people, like incredibly smart people are working on it. And um, I think we're, we all want to get to that point. But, it, yeah, it's just not you don't You yet. don't see it quite yet. Yeah. <laughs> like I say, I'll know um, that somebody's, like, done it when one company just, like, disappears off the, the map in terms of, like, going into test labs multiple times or calling troubleshooting. <laughs> and so far I haven't seen one company, you know, just, like, sitting around feeling very, very smug <laughs> and saying, oh, look at those EMC problems you guys are still having. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm just, I'm waiting, though. Like, you know it's going to happen someday. <laughs> yeah, so this is the future that we all want. <laughs> Press a button, it's all fine. If you haven't heard of Sierra Circuits, Sierra Circuits is a PCB manufacturer and assembler all in one. Located in the Bay Area, uh, right around all the innovation that's happening. And, and Sierra Circuits is capable of building everything from start to finish 
uh, from simple standard product to uber complex, HDIs, flexes, rigid flex, high speed applications, you know, anything that you can think of, we pretty much can build. Uh, and we do it quick. Uh, so if you need to maintain your schedule and be on time, CR Circuits is your vendor of choice. Like I say, there's no reason it shouldn't happen someday. Yes. But uh, from what little I know, again, coming from a very outsider perspective of AI and ML, it's going to be a while. Yeah, you need the data for sure. You need all the examples and the learning and the labeling. And it's, how do you do that in this, you know, with such limited information? Yeah, I, I agree. We, you, you're going to have your job for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Like, none of us want to say, and at that point, we'll all be, you know, out on the street. But, eh, but at that point, we'll all be out on the street. If an engineer wants wants more education about this, what would you recommend? And I, I wanted to ask you a question about standards, actually. Can can an engineer lead on, lean on standards um, as they're developing things? Or what... How, what is the role of standards in, in this? Right. Um, I think there's a tendency to think of standards as the enemy, right? There's a, a standard FCC limit, and if you don't meet it, bad things happen, right? Like, people only run into standards when something goes wrong and they fail the test. Uh, so they tend to be like, God, don't talk to me about standards. <laughs> like, But... Um, in addition to the kind of very strict rule-based standards that you'll see from, again, FCC... Um, there's a EU standards that are like the strictest ones that automotive meets. Um, but there are a lot that are actually best practices or recommended practices. Right. There's also in a lot of standards um, and some that are publicly available. So all the NASA and military standards are publicly available. Well, I mean, aside from the ones that are classified, but the vast majority <laughs> are, are uh, publicly available. Um, those have appendices in them that include an like decades worth of lessons learned of like, when you're doing this kind of testing, here's how you can speed it up, or here's some of the pitfalls, or here's how you should select your antennas to be the most efficient. Um, there's a uh, rec I, I was on a standards committee for ANSI C63.16, which is recommended practice for people who have doing ESD testing. So there's, there's basically like one major test method, IEC 61000-4-2, and then a bunch of other standards that kind of were like, yeah, do it that way. Um, and this recommended practice standard, it's like, again, when you're reading through that standard and it seems kind of opaque and it seems uh, confusing, you know, there are other documents out there that can um, give you really practical advice on how to implement these different things. So, I, I, again, I'm deeply passionate about EMC standards. I, I sit on a lot of the committees. I'm currently the vice president of standards for the IEEE EMC Society. Um, there's so much information in there. The working groups like deeply care about helping people do this right. Are we all the best writers in the world? You know, can we we write the clearest standards document that everybody will just look at and go, why yes, that all makes sense now. Okay, that's, I would love to live in that world. That's not the world we live in. Um, but there is more useful information out there um, that can be very helpful um, as you're kind of working through uh, the standards that apply to you in your industry. Um, the other thing I'd say is, uh, you know, if standards are of interest to you or you're looking for other places to look, um, certainly get in touch. Um, Absolutely. And, and the other thing that I'm very passionate about is getting more people involved in the working groups. Uh, I think people, again, find that like they're handed down from on high or they're, you know, all made by people in secret caves underground, deep underground, right? Like, you know, secret societies. Um, all the, almost all the working groups... This isn't 100% true, but it's surprisingly often true uh, that a lot of working groups are open to almost any practicing EMC engineer, or yeah, any practicing engineer who has a concern in that area. So um, yeah, if that's something that you'd like to get involved in, I strongly encourage people to, to get in touch with me and I you know, can either through uh, my own contacts or friends of friends, I can get you usually into, um, in touch with people who can uh, talk to you about that. That's wonderful. Yeah, my, my next question was, can you name some practical tools? <laughs> AI is not one of those yet. Not one of those. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, yeah, no, it was great. It was great speaking with you. And, you know, really, I, you know, I think it's just really important information. And, um, you know, I always have young engineers like, 
you know, walk up to me and they're like, you know, I, I just heard about this EMC thing. <laughs> right. Have you heard of that before? It's <laughs> like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Welcome. That's... Welcome to the world. <laughs> And that's why I feel bad, right? That it hits everybody like it's the first time. Yeah. And and it's like it doesn't need to be that way. And um, one of the, one of the ways I put it is that I don't understand. Like, if I were a civil engineer, mm-hmm. I would not have a separate one class on how to build bridges and a separate class on how to build bridges that don't fall down. <laughs> right. But somehow we've got all these electrical engineering classes on design. Right. But somehow the topic of how to design electronics that pass regulatory compliance testing, it's considered a separate subject that yes. doesn't come up very often. That's a great point. <laughs> it needs to be edu- uh, integrated. It, it, I don't understand why this and you know PCB design hasn't been fully integrated into the electrical engineering curriculum. And that is true. Um, and again, I know they're, they're individual professors and individual programs um, that are fantastic that, uh, you know, um, Oklahoma State has a really good one. Clemson, thanks to uh, Todd Hubing. Um, some ones um, up in Detroit for the mm-hmm. automotive industry. There's some, uh, especially Professor Mark Stefka really made a big push uh, to get that into the curriculum there. Great. But, oh, and Missouri, uh, University of Missouri Science and Tech, it used to be U Missouri Rolla. Um, they're like the center of excellence. Like if you look at, at a typical EMC conference, a whole bunch of the papers are coming out of that research group. Um, you oh, know, fantastic. they're really uh, top notch. But, you know, unless you're at one of those places, uh, it seems like it's a little it's much more hit or miss. Um, speaking of places where people can get more uh, education sure. on on the topic, um, for people who just want to kind of uh, do more research on their own, uh, the place that I point just about everybody is uh, learnemc.com. So that is Todd Hubing's uh, website. He was a professor at Clemson for a long time. He did a lot of consulting work with the automotive industry. And again, fantastic gentleman and fantastic teacher. Um, He also does seminars online or in person. Uh, A lot of the EMC consultants do. I do, Ken Wyatt does, uh, Pat Andre. Um, So, you know, one of the things that I, I really recommend is that, you know, whenever people are giving those free, like, you know, one hour kind of webinar things, if you dip into a bunch of those and hear everybody's kind of slightly different perspectives on on the subject, um, I feel like it'll really help something. Or you're you're upping your chances. That you'll hear something that'll just make it click, right? That'll, that'll just um, you know make it stick in your mind and go like, oh, now it's clear. Um, you know, I, I hope that people get that from some of the things that I do. I know I've gotten it from. Like Ken and uh, and Todd, you know when I've been learning. Um, so you know, there, there's resources out there. But again, EMC is such a such a niche discipline that unless you go looking for it, it, it can be a little um, a little obscure to yeah, try and find. You're gonna run into a wall. <laughs> but learnemc.com is is uh, he's just got in addition to you know his seminar stuff, he's got a lot of really good fundamental articles that you can read, you know, with good illustrations and and good background that um, I think have been very useful for a lot of people. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much again for for having, you know, for joining us uh, and look forward to many more. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to talk to people and um, yeah, for all the educational outreach that you do, because I I think uh, the more we can get the word out about this kind of thing, um, hopefully we can help make some engineers lives a little easier. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's everything you said was so insightful, so amazing. Uh, (laughs) I know that people are going to definitely enjoy, you know, listening to everything you had to say. So thank you so much. I like to say I I enjoy the chance to ramble about this stuff. (laughs) For some reason, it's the thing that, that just like really sparked my professional passion. You know, I mean, they say, right, if you can if you can line up your career and your work with what really, you know, is truly your passion, then, you know, you're just the luckiest person. Pretty so. much. <laughs> so it's much, much, be- it's been much, much better than the very boring aerospace career that I <laughs> thought I was going to have back in the, uh, you know, like early 2000s. Yeah, it's interesting how where life takes people sometimes.